Okay, good morning from Reno. Um, thank you, Pat and Danell, for this uh, the pleasure of allowing me to speak at your conference here. Um, that was a wonderful introduction, Juan. I appreciate it. Uh, I feel like I'm the, the token representative uh, here from the private practice world and this really esteemed group of speakers here this morning. I'm really honored for that. Um, I spoke to Volker last night and uh, we were really, I fondly recalled uh, my fellowship there after Mayo in 2000 to the, the Millennial Fellow. Uh, at the time, uh, Randall Porter was just a new uh, attending that year uh, and uh, Nick Theodore was the chief resident and I, it was a pleasure being uh, Volker's fellow and uh, it's an honor now to sort of bat clean up for the BNI team here uh, after Juan, who's now the you know, Sontag uh, chairman. I don't have any disclosures uh, pertinent to this talk. Uh, so again, as uh, Juan said, uh, Augmedics, uh, X-Vision systems, really the only uh, uh, commercially available and the first uh, reality guidance uh, system for surgery, allows surgeons really to see through the skin. Um, this is, uh, you know, out of the Jetsons. So when you first do this, you know, you, it's a wow factor uh, when you see it and you first get used to it. Um, as we'll show here in a few uh, demonstrations, it accurately guides instruments and implants during spine procedure. Um, some of the limitations of uh, current systems um, you know, are, are obvious, line of sight interference, attention shift, learning curve is long, they're quite expensive for some systems. And importantly here, I pulled this uh, paper here, Roger Hartle, and I spoke to Roger yesterday. So 2013, he, he reckoned there were 15% of spine surgeons using it, and um, I asked him yesterday what his current philosophy was, how many did he think we're using it now, and he states it, no more than 25%. So in looking at that, we have a, a huge uh, hill to climb, but a lot of opportunity uh, with this. And as Nick said, you know, in cranial, they've adopted it very well. And I think as we develop the technology, as the companies develop better use of the technology, this will be just a natural transition for us. And it'll be a uh, you know, state of art for everybody. Uh, just Mary, compare and contrast a little bit here. Some of it's been uh, reviewed this morning. Um, Nick, I still use the robot, the Excelsius, in one of our hospital systems. I like it. Uh, I do uh, complex cases with it. But if we look at it, just in a, a, a compare and contrast a little bit, uh, the pro one of the limitations on the big systems, high capital investment, large OR footprint, distraction from the patient, attention shift, as Juan pointed out, uh, not well integrated to the surgical flow. There's just a lot of, a lot of steps to go through, long learning curve, um, and uh, often tied to specific implants. So, you know, looking at that, the X-Vision minimizes some of that. Uh, certainly a much smaller capital investment, uh, no footprint issues, very intuitive, natural line of sight and view, and it's, it's a very easy system to, uh, to get used to, uh, in my experience. Uh, minimal disruption of flow, shorter learning curve, natural line of sight. And what was important to me to bring this into one of our hospitals was this is an open platform uh, for any system uh, of implants. And I thought that was really one of the most uh, important uh, points when I started working with this company. What's really exciting looking at the future and you know, to, to really to, to create the future, you have to define it. So I think if we look at where things are going from a hospital system, we look at value-based care, we're really going to transition into uh, a lower cost of care and a site of service in a surgical center. Um, so I'm excited about a platform like this that can uh, really be introduced to our surgery center. We're putting one in our surgery center now. Uh, there is no possibility of putting in a robot in our surgery center given the restraints of cost and size and the ORs. But uh, this system will work with a, a, a 3D, uh, CT, uh, 3D fluoro uh, very well and uh, is really uh, uh, so competitive in price that it's a great option. Looking at the, the genius behind this, and we'll talk about some of the history and, and why it's taken a while to develop this, um, with Nissan and his group from Augmetics uh, out of Tel Aviv and in Israel. The, the, the beauty and the, the genius is in the headset. There's a transparent uh, augmented reality display for 3D uh, sight, as Juan said, and then, then the 2D uh, CT scan, the uh, axial and sagittal images. They're all projected onto your retina. It's, uh, so it's fascinating when you put it on, first of all, it's all a built-in tracking mechanism for your uh, tools. And, and uh, that you're uh, using and your implants as so the powerful uh, processor you'll see it's a personal thing. So if we look at this, we, it's a, a applied here, um, my workflow, I, I place it myself as they're doing the, the uh, O-arm spin. 
And uh, you're, you're seeing this in your, your uh, heads, heads up display in addition to the 3D, which I'm seeing here. And this just demonstrates what the room sees and it, it shows that, you know, Lynch can chew gum and uh, talk at the same time, um, being Irish and loquacious. But this is what I'm seeing in the headlight and the head, uh, headset. Uh, this is what the room is seeing and it's uh, all in computer. So that the staff can see it, your resident can see it, you know, in academics, or you can have a second headset. And the, 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 the nurse and, and uh, tech can see it. So overall, this has been proven to be effective. We won't belabor it, but you know, it's a, within millimeter accuracy like the other systems, and not, not really to be compared, but it, uh, it's really been published well. Uh, Camilo uh, Molino was um, uh, resident under uh, Nick and Hopkins and uh, Frank Phillips and his team. They did a really nice job, and they published this in Journal of Neurosurgery Cadaver Study, showing it was technically feasible, accurate, and highly precise method of placement. So they put in 93 screws, five surgeons. They looked at it uh, equally divided, lumbar and thoracic. And I'll leave this for people to look at afterwards. But basically, they looked at the virtual, the actual screws, uh, compared the angle and the, the tip position, and uh, you know, did this classical Gertzman and um, Heary scale. And they found in the lumbar, they were 100% accurate, put all the screws where they're supposed to be. In the thoracic, there was one screw, they tried to place a 5.5 screw in a 3.5 millimeter pedicle. And so that was the only one that was slightly out. But uh, you know, all overall, all the systems are within the you know, same uh, catchment area, 98, 99% accuracy. So accuracy is not the issue, Pre precision is not the issue. It's really just, it's proven here, this is uh, going head to head for the FDA clearance uh, with Stealth Station, and it just shows sub-millimeter um, accuracy um, with 99% under the uh, upper boundary limit. Um, so this has been around a long time. I mean, historically, you know, this has been in evolution for over 50 years. Professor I Ivan Sutherland from Harvard, you know, in 1966, it looks like something out of, you know, some space uh, movie that you'd see, you know. Um, uh, and then uh, Steve Mon and MIT tried it, and so, the, the getting it forward, we look at other systems that have been out there, and a lot of these are just heads-up displays. They're not navigation systems. But the most uh, well-known here and the, the largest failure for a conglomerate of, globe, uh, of uh, Google here, excuse me, um, is the, the glass. I mean, they had so much money behind it, and uh, Google Glass is going to be the be-all and end-all. You don't even need a, an Apple Watch. You don't need a computer. It's just going to be a heads-up display. Walk around with your glasses, and you got all the information of the world uh, you know, at, your, at your retinal tips. The reality didn't happen. They failed. They failed miserably, and they decided not to proceed with it. So uh, Professor Fuchs was trying this in 92. You can see how big and awkward. It's basically like a microscope hanging off this person's head, demonstrating it. And of course, a little smaller, and a couple of decades later, uh, in, uh, two decades later, 2012, with uh, Ebe, uh, it's basically a video camera attached to a, a headpiece. Uh, this was in Japan. This is another one that never made it to the States in Sony. Uh, another big company tried it hard, did not get it, despite millions of dollars invested in it. Again, a glorified heads-up display. Stryker had this in 2001, the video loops. Uh, again, heads-up uh, display, not navigation, nothing to do with reality whatsoever. So Professor Fuchs came out with the idea that, uh, and he was the leading uh, edge at the time, he said, look, the tracking everything else seems to be pretty good, but it's really the head-mounted display uh, is the issue. And that was the really thing that was lacking. He was very confident and looking forward to the Google's uh, Project Glass for the Google Glass, and, uh, you know, it failed. Many other systems are out there. Truly, they're, they're, they're various video game type machines. They don't uh, involve surgical navigation. So they have limited in their application, uh, and they're basically showing you images to, instead of a screen, they're showing them on your, your, uh, your eyes in a video game kind of world. And so that's it. There's a lot out there for sure. Um, this is not virtual reality. This is augmented reality. There's a difference. Virtual reality is not FDA approved to be placed in the patient because it's not there yet. It's too dangerous. Um, but there's a lot on social media and everything on this. But if we want to channel our uh, Tony Stark and we'll look at it, this is kind of where we're going. Um, this is probably, I've never been in a fighter um, pilot uh, helmet, but I've got to imagine this is what they're seeing. They, they still got to see the runway, they got to see things ahead of them, but they're getting a lot of information at their uh, retinal level, 
And, uh, and this is what is allowing them to perform complex maneuvers at high speeds and really uh, engage uh, as they need to with all data points uh, that they need relevant uh, in their field of view. And the same with a video-based uh, technology here in Pokemon. So what are we talking about? Other systems, really no reality in the other systems, as we said. Optic systems are extremely inaccurate, um, up to two centimeters error, light visibility, projection issues. Video-based augmented reality, really glorified video screen. They're gamer systems. A very uncomfortable headset, to say the least, and uh, cause a lot of disorientation. And you're not, you know, you're sort of removed from your room. You sort of put those on at various meetings and you kind of feel your hands are up in the air and you're touching things, but like you could not do surgery in that, that environment. So what is the, the beauty and the, the fascination behind this system and I've, I've, you know, I got with this company to say I needed something else for the surgical center realm that I'm very much involved with uh, around the country and locally here and I knew this is the future so we, we have to step away when you're a private practice uh, neurosurgeon in a community hospital, you don't have the bells and whistles that are available like in, in the Barrow, Stanford, Mayo, that you just have all this at your disposal to have any system that you, you choose. We, have, we cover five hospital uh, systems here in Reno, so we really have to cut, a, cut our cloth to our measure and really be uh, financially uh, astute with that. The, the beauty about this system, simply put here, the occlusion mass technology, the combination of optic and video, uh, is dynamic occlusion really allows um, uh, you to see what you're working on and it occludes the uh, region of interest uh, on the spine. So you can bake out the skin around it. Um, you're not really looking at it because you, you don't want to see the skin. You, you really want to see your entry points where you are. Once you get make the skin incision and your, your tools enter the skin, it's irrelevant where the skin is in space and time. It's highly accurate using transparent lenses which uh, allow the projection to your retina maximum navigation accuracy, and uh, really a small overlay. Uh, so the workflow, like we spoke before, same thing. For now, they put a uh, clamp on the spinous process. At that stage, I put that on. I step out. The O-arm comes in. We do a 3T spin. We've uh, uh, been fortunate to move up from first generation O-arm to second generation, which has helped in image capture and a, a clear image for sure. Uh, I've really been uh, fortunate. So as they're doing the, the spin, here, is, you know, they're just bringing it in the room, you know, as one quick spin, that's when I, I scrub out. I generally go see the next patient, sign the notes. Um, I don't have residents, I have PAs, but uh, sign the notes, come back in, pop on the headset, and then uh, we let the magic begin then. So other image capture systems are relevant, and I think this is really pertinent for the surgery center environment for cost-effective care uh, that we were speaking about. Siemens have a, a very uh, great system of 3D imaging, the CS system shown here, and also the Zeem have a very compatible 3D, wonderful system as well. So if any of the hospitals, the pr uh, smaller community hospitals are looking at a platform, and they already have an existing 3D fluoro, this is a very easy adjunct and an add-on, I feel. And they don't have to really step into the, you know, the Rolls Royce, if you like. Maybe they just need like a Lexus to kind of get them by until it's adapted by the surgeons. We all know there are, uh, uh, I won't mention names, but uh, image systems around hospitals sitting, gathering dust, just like the lasers did in the 80s. And um, the reality is, you know, hospitals just can't make those uh, mistakes anymore, just buying whatever the surgeons need. So it can support two headsets, you know, always eyes on the patient, no footprint in this field. This is what you see. And now uh, this is basically, you, you line up, start tapping, put in the virtual K wire on the, on the um, pedicle screw, move along. This is one of the early cases in, in July, probably first bunch of cases. Uh, screws, this is what you see thrown in there. Um, this is the new iteration now. It shows the, the, uh, the green lines here. If you stay within that, you're stay within safe distance of two millimeters. This is just backing up an X lift that I performed this week. And I'm just guiding down, as you see on the, the top left screen, between the cage and the, the lateral uh, screws. I'm sort of guiding it down there, both in the sagittal and the, uh, the axial plane there. And, and I've stayed within the, the green zone, so I get a bonus point for that. And so uh, I'm very comfortable with that. I always just do one seat O-arm spin. I've never spun uh, the O-arm after surgery. I generally do a post-op fluoro and we move along next room, next patient. I started uh, four months ago. To date, 
Uh, we have over 45 cases. I know by this week uh, we'll have over 50 cases. Uh, I have over 40 personally. Uh, it's been a wonderful adjunct to my practice and to my, uh, my group with Eddie and Shane. Um, Nissen, the founder and CEO, uh, had the privilege uh, of coming over from Tel Aviv and witnessing his first live uh, surgery at, in our uh, renowned Reno Hospital here, and he's there in the second from the left, and just a, a wonderful guy, an engineering background, worked for, uh, you know, worked for Medtronic for years as a distributor, and just really, he's been at this 10 years, and you know, it's the classical 10-year um, overnight success, so he's put his heart and soul into this. Brilliant mind, just he, he's he's Gretzky. He's skating where the puck's going to be, and 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 I, to to tag on to where Juan is, which is a brilliant intro and in a neutral kind of fashion. Like all systems are going there, he's just way ahead at the moment, and and I think everybody's going to see that. This was my first case. We kind of had to flip the order for a, a, a problem. I was like everything, planning to do a one level, so I'd kind of learn the specs and get it going, but we had to flip the order of the patient for a, a reason, so this patient had a previous uh, four to one Lamy fusion elsewhere years ago, and I was just popping it out with uh, two X lifts above and, and lateral uh, plates, and then I, I just joined in and I, I tracked down the, the, uh, the previous screw holes, and I just found them and uh, tracked down them those ways, screws at the bottom don't look so good, but that was done uh, several years ago. So that was the first case, and I was comfortable with that. And I'm, you know, I'm, as I said, Nick and I are same generation with Randall, and uh, I'm 55, so I'm not a millennial. The next talk, and you know, but I have to stay with the technology. Otherwise, you get bored and you get burned out. So you have to, you know, stay ahead. This is a second case, same thing above a, an old T lift from years ago. Just shows the disadvantages of T lifts, the long term collapse, and Juan knows more about that than anybody. And that's the beauty about the X lift case. So I back up a lot of cases here. If I put a plate on, most times, unless they have a gross instability with with, spond uh, with parts defects, I'll just do unilateral uh, perk screws on this. This is joining to a prior construct. I just clipped a bit of the took out one screw, clipped a bit of the rod, and then uh, just popped in a you know two inch incision, throw on some screws. This is backing up two level a lift um, all along, and this is what we see. And very easy, uh, simple system. Uh, two level X lift, same thing again. This is a uh, 360 A lift, uh, two X lifts, interbody uh, four web cages and plating. Um, personal observations: uh, it's it's a customized headset for each surgeon. You're not using somebody else's headset. Not that I'm really against that. When COVID era, it's nice to have your own. The hospital looks after you. You get it. You bring a lot of business to them. So far, we've been very fortunate. Uh, no take backs on uh, any of our uh, 45 plus cases. No revisions needed. Uh, uh, I, we don't, I don't believe in another uh, OR at the end of the case. Other rooms have to use it. Other surgeons have to use it. Don't believe in uh, cannibalizing their time. Uh, it's important to find a compatible system with a nav lock. That's all. You can work with any uh, spine system out there. This is a truly, a truly vendor agnostic. Your local team, we had uh, the, the uh, Augmetics team here for the first few cases. After that, our local rep team have taken care of it. They've all got in-service. It's just like running a fluoro. I mean, it's that easy. Uh, with the addition of the posterior pin, uh, like the other systems, that's going to aid things and be nicer than the spinous clamp. Uh, it really, this is not really a replacement. It's not a one or the other. Uh, I see it complementing existing technology and robotics and navigation, and kind of like my my furry family here of Golden Retrievers of Carolina. We got Hugo, Mia. They're kind of the robotics and the navigation ones. Well, Five-year-old, seven-year-old, and Jack. Jack's Jack's the new kid. He's ten year, ten months old. He's playful, but he's exciting, and uh, you know, like the, the this emerging technology of X Vision, I'm excited to see Jack's development, and I'm excited to see where this emerging technology, uh, which I see as one of the most exciting platforms that we have out there in this current uh, generation going forward. Uh, short learning curve, honestly, I thought it'd be 10 cases at, at, at best. Uh, I think it really was five cases, to be honest. Uh, and, I, and I'm an old guy. I'm 55. I wasn't a big, you know, navigation guy from day one. I had like the old ways as well. But um, anyways, the hospital learning curve, they adapted it, got excited. Software interference was very intuitive. High degree of actually proximity, potential further capacity uh, capabilities with uh, navigated uh, um, uh, cages, insertion, navigated uh, docking station for our tubes. Uh, it's all there. We celebrated our 30th case there with a little Amazon smiley face uh, with everything. So I just want to thank everybody. Thank Pat, Danelle, uh, for this opportunity. And um, 
Good morning.